Good morning, and happy 4th of July to everyone. I just want to let you know that this is an active participation event, okay? Um, if you're going down the program, um, the first thing that we'll ask you to do is stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and the Scouts will lead that. Um, during the Armed Forces Pride of America, we'll sing the anthem for each branch of service, and we'll announce them. And if you or a family member served in that branch of service, please stand while your anthem is sung. And then at the end of that arrangement is the Star Spangled Banner, and we'll ask everyone to stand and join us in singing that. Um, then a little farther down the line, we are fortunate to have two original compositions about New Harmony, and we're going to sing both of them today. And the words to the refrain are on the back, and we ask you to sing along. Thank you so much. Good morning. Would everyone please stand for the presentation of the colors? Color guard attention. Color guard forward march. Color guard Holt, color guard post the colors. Believe to our signing the Pledge of Allegiance. Guard retreat. You may now be seated. Good morning, everyone. I'm Katie Reinecke, president of the Friends of the Working Men's Institute. And on behalf of the Friends, Historic New Harmony, and the New Harmony Kiwanis Club, welcome to the 203rd annual New Harmony Independence Day celebration. We'd like to especially thank Historic New Harmony for the use of this wonderful facility today. In 1814, New Harmony citizens gathered together to celebrate their nation's independence with music by the Harmonist Band, free beer, and, <clears throat> excuse me. and some years later, a free dinner for the 200 neighboring settlers who attended. In 1897, the Women's Library Club, now the Friends of the Working Men's Institute, began sponsoring the event, which included an address by a community member, patriotic music, and the reading of the Declaration of the Independence. And in honor of our over 200-year tradition, we will be partaking in those same festivities today, except for the free beer. <laughs> I'd like to share some words by William Owen from the 1827 Fourth of July celebration. Though nearly 200 years old, these words still capture the magnitude of this holiday. We meet in remembrance of a day when a nation which had long suffered under the iron rod of oppression and had vainly sought redress from that power, whose duty it was to guard her rights and to shield her from wrong, stood forth in sight of an admiring world, dared to assert those rights and that liberty, which is the birthright of every human being. One year ago today, I attended my very first New Harmony celebration for the 4th of July, and I witnessed the extent to which New Harmony still values that liberty. I expected to walk into a room of maybe 20 or so people, and instead I walked into a packed auditorium full of red, white, and blue, and I was wearing black. <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> now, as a new member of the community, I'm overwhelmed 
by the warm welcome I've received by everyone. And I never imagined that I'd be standing in front of you all today. It is truly an honor to be here. And one of my favorite parts of this celebration is hearing the stirring, wonderful patriotic music. So now let us hear some of that wonderful music performed by the New Harmony Community Choir under the direction of Tina Schutte as they sing the Armed Forces Pride of America.
On July 4, 1776, Congress approved the Declaration of Independence and then further ordered that copies of the Declaration be sent to several assemblies, conventions, or committees, or councils of safety, and to several commanding officers of the Continental Troops, that it be proclaimed in each of the United States and at the heads of the Army. Let us listen now as Mr. Kurt Schmidt recites our Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations Pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish their right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them 
and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws of, for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they sh should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in, our, in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. For suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the ex executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their own hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us 
and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you, Kurt. Each year, it is tradition for a member of the community to give an address, and it is my honor to introduce this person to you. We have a very unique speaker with us today. <clears throat> While he is a well-known member of our community for over a decade, he has only recently become officially a member of the or a citizen of the United States. He lives and works from his base here in New Harmony sometimes known as a performative architect with a wide range of interests that engage art, design, scholarship, and popular culture, with subjects ranging from gun culture, primitive geometry, labyrinths, and political satire. Currently, he is curating and delivering lectures that delve into taboo subjects, matters that are outside the accepted and normative design. <clears throat> educated at the Architectural Association in London, Cooper Union School of Architecture, and Cranbrook Academy of Art, he is now Associate Professor at SAIC Chicago. And he also, he also co-edited Utopia in the Cornfields, Architecture, Landscape, and Preser Preservation in New Harmony, which will be published later this year. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Nicholson.
Good morning. My thanks to Katie for her kind introduction to the Working Man's Institute and the Kiwanis, and to New Harmony that has become my home for the past decade. After 35 years of being a legal immigrant, last year I became an American citizen. The process is exacting. Study of every aspect of the country is required, and it gives real time to think about things that we loosely take for granted. Reading through the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution written 11 years later, one is reminded that the Declaration was a brazen challenge to Britain's fledgling empire, and the Constitution was its masterful resolution. New Harmony's Independence Day speeches were started by George Rapp, who had the good fortune to arrive on America's shores on July the 4th. So he and his community were able to celebrate doubly. Fifty years after the Declaration of Independence, Robert Owen continued the tradition of speeches. In the book sale at the WNI last month, I was able to buy a slight volume of early July the 4th speeches made by Robert Owen, William Owen, and Frances Wright, a woman who was America's first ab uh, advocate of abolition. Thinking that by reading parts of these speeches this morning and being bathed in the sweet musings of New Harmony's founders, I was slightly taken aback by their feisty, revolutionary tenor. In his 1826 speech, Robert Owen declared, mankind is a slave to a trinity of monstrous evils. One, private or individual property. Two, absurd and irrational systems of religion. Three, marriage founded on property and combined with religion. The revolution is this, the destruction of this hydra of evils. It's no wonder that the communist Karl Marx gave credit to Robert Owen for his communistic ideals. A year later, in 1827, William Owen, his son, celebrated the first anniversary of his father's Declaration of Mental Independence. <laughs> William proposed 12 soul-searching questions that he believed were made possible by the events of 1776. His questions included the following couplet. Dare we follow truth to whatever result the investigation may lead us? Are we ready to extend the hand of friendship freely to every human being alike, to Jew or the Turk, as to the Christian, acknowledging no distinction that, but that of sterling worth and moral rectitude? Are we prepared for this? Then we may rejoice. We are secured in the greatest blessings which man, according to our present knowledge, can ever attain. Indeed, we do enjoy political freedom and religious and mental liberty. The following year, in 1828, Frances Wright delivered her speech on the responsibilities of being an American that emphasized the ability to change. She declared, what is the physical world but change? The great beauty of American government is the principle of improvement. She advised mistaking blind nationalism for patriotism. Love America not because it's your country, but because it is the palladium of liberty. On immigration and by extension slavery, she stated, America is the home of all nations in the veins of whose citizens flow the blood of every people of the globe. In conclusion, she said, let us rejoice as men, not as children, as human beings rather than Americans. 
as reasoning beings, not as ignorance. In light of these three speeches, we witness the aspirations of mental independence, extending the hand of friendship to every corner of the globe, and the ability to change. The speeches continue to inspire at the international, the national, the state, and local levels, as does the town of New Harmony itself. I first came to work in America in 1975, and it's taken over 40 years to become an American citizen. After concluding studies in New York and Detroit, my early status was a voluntary exile, a state of being that artists of every stripe have been drawn to over the years, be they Hemingway in Cuba and James Baldwin and Picasso in Paris. You may fairly ask, why become a voluntary exile? An expatriate gives the illusion of life as a virtual citizen of no place, where you can observe its culture as well as your own with impunity. But there comes a time when that kind of search for truth is found wanting. It is replaced by a visceral need to commit to the land and the political ideals of your adopted home. Although being a foreign registered alien gives you many of the same rights as a US citizen, you can even own a gun, you will always be a guest. Registered aliens cannot be active participants in the fullness of America's well-being. They cannot vote, nor can they hold office. A registered alien is in a state of constant alertness wondering if the next opinion you write, the next plum that you pick, the next five miles an hour over the speed limit you might drive could all have consequences that might turn topsy-turvy. For a registered alien, returning from an overseas trip carries with it the delicate aroma of trepidation. When a TSA agent drops the crunchy bang of a rubber stamp into your passport, it is always a relief to get back to the USA. The process of becoming a citizen is exacting. The checks and the paperwork are exhaustive and the tests are revealing. The US Citizen and Immigration Services publishes a book called Learn About the United States to prepare you for the oath. It's compiled of 100 questions of which you will be asked 10, and you have to get six right. It's a great book, and one which should be read annually by all, citizen or not. My favorite question is number 55. <laughs> what are two ways that Americans can participate in their democracy? Vote, join a political party, Help with a campaign, join a civic group, join a community group. Give an elected official your opinion on an issue. <laughs> Call senators and representatives. Publicly support or oppose an issue. Run for office. Write to a newspaper. The least challenging question, but the one I most enjoyed, is number 89. What is on the west coast of the United States? <laughs> you may wonder what question 90 is. What is on the east coast? <laughs> You've got it, the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> the naturalization ceremony was held in Indianapolis, two days short of Constitution Day on September the 17th. Each branch of government is represented, and some of the dignitaries give a speech to the assembly. Every one of the 14 dignitaries on the stage was of European stock, although five proxies were former immigrants from across the globe. The 96 candidates were from 31 countries. Now, 
Imagine zooming around on Google Earth and dropping in on Bolivia, Burma, China, Egypt, Eritrea, Haiti, Israel, Jamaica, Kenya, Lebanon, Mongolia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Peru, Russia, Sudan, Syria, Turkey, and Vietnam. And that's just the half of them. What was startling to hear in this litany of countries was that apart from two lone Brits and a beating heart from Bosnia, there was not one citizen from what is loosely called Europe. There was no individual from Ireland, from Germany, Scandinavia, Poland, or even Italy. Between the 14 dignitaries of European stock and the 96 new citizens from everywhere but Europe, you could feel the tremendous excitement of the new America. It still lives up to the very same tenets of inclusion that our forefathers laid out. As was said during the naturalization ceremony, the US stands unique in the world, a composite of all persons of the world. Continue to weave your lives into a broad tapestry to make our country. The speeches were inspiring. The then governor, Mike Pence, stated, I know you have been feeling that sense of nervousness all the time. You, we, are American citizens. And with those very words, I grew a new respect for the governor, now Vice President Pence, for his very real and personal empathy towards immigrants. Pamela Jones of the Indiana Bar Association noted that the essence of the United States is that which unites us. It is not ethnicity, nations, or religions. What unites us is an idea. And Eileen Swanson then gave an award to the eldest new citizen. A woman arose, stooped and well into her 90s, and was handed a star-spangled banner that had flown over the Indiana State Capitol. Her name was Fatima, meaning daughter of Prophet Muhammad, who had immigrated from Syria and was no doubt a grandmother. It is at these moments that you want to cry, for the Declaration of Independence is still every bit as powerful as it was when it was first written. This truly is a nation where the poem inscribed on the Statue of Liberty reads true. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. What I learned that day is that America is indeed a nation of first peoples mingled with a steady flow of immigrants under bondage or free will. The new co cohort of immigrants is no longer from old Europe, but from the Far East, the Middle East, Africa, and South and Central America. They are the face of change that Fanny Wright anticipated nearly 200 years ago. Our collective embrace of common goals, made of the best ideas from scores of different nations, will always overwhelm prejudice. Let us celebrate this day by shaking hands with new neighbors, listening carefully to views counter to our own, and being ready to adjust accordingly. The ability to change is at the heart of America's greatness, giving it the pulse it has always had and will continue to have in the future. Now, every aspect of life has its moment of the ridiculous and the sublime. After such a moving ceremony, you may wonder what the first thing I did after becoming an American. Well, on driving home to New Harmony, I spied a Baskin and Robbins ice cream parlor <laughs> and celebrated with a double scoop of butter pecan and Jamocha almond fudge. <laughs> Sensing my newfound freedom as an American citizen, I slipped across the border to Kentucky and plumped 
for Robert Owen's Trinity of Monstrous Evils. In the, it is the perfect place for finding the unholy trinity uh, 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 at the uh, ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. <laughs> in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, they grow the sweet leaves, they distill the sour mash, and they shape barrels, both for whiskey and muskets. Asking a Kentuckian for a carton of real smokes was interesting. Unequivocally, they said, you want real? Get a carton of 24 sevens, the cheapest smokes out there. Asking a Kentuckian which bottle of whiskey is best would probably lead to the Second Civil War. But the, <laughs> but the consensus was that bullet whiskey was a pretty good drink for a price, if a man had to choose. Next stop was to fill in the blanks of the Second Amendment. Once again, Kentuckians make a pretty good advisors for a little something to tuck beneath the belt. Go for Dirty Harry's Smith & Wesson. <laughs> As Clint declared, a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> I did feel lucky, for I had become an American citizen. In conclusion, there's no place in the world as open, fascinating, liberating, and just plain comfortable as America. It really is a place where anything goes. However much crabbiness, staged incivility, and back and forth discussion that make up our current political discourse, one thing is certain, that when the going gets tough, we will pull through as one. This is not to suggest that we need to institute a hug a Republican day, or dish it up for the Democrats day, far from it. The beauty of our political system is that we are duty bound to listen carefully to those with whom we disagree. Our government is one in which we are expected to participate in civil challenges and build constructive counterpoints. So thank you, America, for being such a place and long live the Democratic Republic. <laughs> that, I think we should sing. Back on the back of your sheet.
Today we are going to name the new 
Harmony Outstanding Community Volunteer. Our first recipients um, were Don and Gail Williams. Don passed away a few weeks ago, and Gail's been gone about two years. Um, when looking around New Harmony, many people of all ages are watched as they do various duties to improve the look of our town, help neighbors in need, help organizations grow and keep them growing and just being there when needed. We had great nominations. The selection was difficult. All persons nominated are truly seen throughout the community as being worthy of this award, but today we can only honor one individual. This individual works on the Posey County Council for Aging, active in Johnson United Methodist Church with many activities, volunteers at River Days and Coons Fest, involved with United Way of Posey County, Working Men Institute member, and is a Kiwanis member. It is with great pleasure that I present to you at this time New Harmony's Outstanding Community Volunteer for 2017, Kenyon Bailey. name on a plaque inside the Revere Gym, and he will receive a $100 gift certificate to the Red Wagon, take the wife out for dinner, <laughs> and he gets this stuff to board here. Tell our attention. Audience, please rise. Color guard forward march. Color guard halt. Color guard retrieve the colors. Color Guard Retreat. Thank you so much to Kurt and to Ben and especially the community choir. This concludes our ceremony today and please join Please join us immediately following for the golf cart parade, which will proceed to McClure Park for our town picnic. Thank you, and happy 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs>